I am Keith Cooper. I am the co-director of the Ken Kennedy Institute, and it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Moshe Vardy. He's one of those rare people who people refer to with a single name. Most of you know him, but that notwithstanding, I think he deserves a formal introduction. Moshe is a professor in the Department of Computer Science. He has a whole bunch of titles. He is the Karen Ostrom George Professor in Computational Engineering. He is a Distinguished Service Professor of Rice University, and he is the Director of the Kennedy Institute for Information Technology. Um, he's won more awards than I can name, so I'll limit myself to a couple. Um, the ACM Kurt Girdle Prize, the ACM Paris Kanalakis Award, the ACM EF Cod Prize, each of those from very different interest groups inside ACM, and the Blaise Pascal Medal. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering of the United States, the National Academy of Science of the United States, the European Academy of Science, and the Academia Europa, and I left out the Ameri American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's long been concerned about the future of work. In the mid-2000s, he chaired a task force for the Association of Computer Machinery that looked at the future of work, and in particular, the impact of offshoring. Uh, for the last several years, he's been wandering North, South America, and Europe, and there may be other continents, talking about the future of work, and he's finally come home to talk to us about it. Professor Horry. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, for the kind words. Thank you all for, uh, for coming here. So just before I get into the subject matter, I want to start with a bit of more personal introduction. So I spent most of my scholarly life working in the deep guts of uh, theoretical computer science, publishing papers, looking at citations. About 10 years ago, I did chair a study about uh, software offshoring. And the conclusion was nothing to worry about. So I kind of put the chapter to rest and go back to writing papers. And then something happened about five years ago, and that kind of led to a shift of my, in my career. And it led to things like that. <laughs> so uh, this happened after my father passed away. And uh, as far as my father was concerned, originally I was supposed to be a rabbi. And <laughs> theoretical computer scientist was uh, second best. I'm not sure how he would feel about this, uh, this uh, headline. <laughs> so we will go back and try to be something that my brother would be proud of. <laughs> so what happened? Let me tell you the story of AI. Let me go back and uh, go back uh, to the uh, middle of the 20th century. So I'm sure many of you have heard of Alan Turing. This is a sculpture in Bletchley Park of Alan Turing, who died exactly in the year that just three weeks, in fact, before I was born. He died, most ostensibly committed suicide. In 1950, Alan Turing wrote uh, one of the most cited papers in philosophy, Computer Machinery and Intelligence. The paper is mostly famous for the so-called Turing test or imitation test. And uh, you can see here a picture of, from the movie. The movie is mostly fiction. But the paper was a philosophical analysis about the possibility of intelligent machines. And Turing was an optimist. He wrote in the paper, towards the end of the paper, he writes, I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words and generally educated opinions will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machine thinking without expecting to be contradicted. Well, you know, here we are. It's past the end of the century. It is laptop thinking. I think most of us will say, no, not really. It's not really thinking. So maybe we can say Turing was too much of an optimist, even though his philosophic analysis is still sharp and compelling today. And in fact, this early optimism was characteristic of the early pioneers in artificial intelligence, Simon and Newell in 1958, saying, OK, we have 10 years to solve the chess problem. They didn't. Minsky in 67, you know, give us another 25 years, we'll solve this problem. They quite didn't. So for many years, people thought of AI is a field that overpromises and underdelivers. So 
when I was a, a graduate student, people talk about the AI winter. In particular, it means that progress is slow and more worrisome. Funding is tight. This is the big thing. Funding was tight. And then another decade passed, and there was a big hype about something called the Japanese fifth generation, whatever it was, and another decade of dearth of research funding. And many people start to write off AI. And then things start turning around. In 1997, uh, I was already at Rice, and I was invited by IBM. I came from IBM. IBM invited me to come to go to New York City and watch the, the tournament, watch the uh, IBM Deep Blue playing against Kasparov. And I watched the first game, and in the first game, uh, Deep Blue won. And I came to the conclusion, I'm sorry, Kasparov won the first game. And I came to the conclusion, well, computer will win, but the time has not come yet, and I'm here, I'm in New York, and I left my wife in Houston. So I'm going to, not going to wait for the second game. I'll fly back to Houston. <laughs> and so I flew back to Houston. And the second game was, the first game, Kasparov was white. The second game, Du Blue was white. And Kasparov planned for that and laid a, a brilliant ambush. And Du Blue did not fall into the trap. And he plays, Du Blue played such a brilliant game that Kasparov was convinced that there is a team of chess players conspiring against him. He couldn't believe this was done by a machine. And so psychologically, he really lost the, 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 the contest in the second game. He never recovered from that. Today, your, your phone can play uh, world-class chess. I mean, nobody today thinks of computers playing against uh, humans, trying seriously to play against computers. 2011, I told you that there was something that happened in 2011. Again, IBM developed something called Watson. Today, you hear about IBM become a marketing slogan, Watson, 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 Watson. But Watson won in jeopardy, defeating the, the two greatest uh, jeopardy champions, Bud Rader and Ken Jennings, by a significant margin. And that seems really genuinely much more intelligent because chess was very clear, just brute force search. This was understanding, you know, knowing history, understanding social culture. Really, it was an, a turning point. This was the point in which I thought, wow, you know, this AI business is not something only in the far future. It's happening now. What are the social implications? And that was the point in which I started reading and educating myself about societal, societal implications. Just to jump to what happened this year, just earlier this year, now it's not, it's not IBM, it's Google, AlphaGo, a program of Google, a company called DeepMind, which Google bought, won in Go, and it beat a Korean champion with the world champion, Lee Sedol, in four out of five games. Now, this technically was very, very different, and I have to explain. So how do you win in chess? So there is something called, we call the game tree. Consider the initial configuration, then there are various moves that the first player, the white, can take, and then there are moves that black can respond, and then there are moves that white can respond. That gives you a tree. The tree goes very, very fast. Okay, it becomes humongous. It becomes astronomically large. And part, one of the innovation in IBM, then how deep you can look into the game. If you can look 10 moves ahead into a game, this is more than any human players can do. So this is really brute force search was the way IBM won in chess. But in AlphaGo, Alpha, so Go is a simpler game, but there are more configurations. As a result, the tree, the number of configurations is, is even much larger than it is in chess. There's no way to, to do a deep, deep search into the tree. So in addition to tree search techniques, uh, AlphaGo used what we call a, a search space reduction techniques. And what did it do? First of all, it, it digested all Go games that have ever been published. A few hundred thousand games have been published. Then it started playing against itself. And it played about 30 million games against itself, learning from this which positions are good, which configuration are good, which moves are good. Learning in something, uh, using a technique called deep learning. In a sense, Alpha would develop intuition to how to play go well. And what do I mean by intuition? A good player makes a move not by saying, well, I follow this sequence of rules. You just have a feeling to what's the right way to move in this case. And Alpha would develop this kind of intuition. Now, what's significant about this that 50 years ago, a philosopher, Michael Polanyi, wrote something that became known as the Polanyi's paradox. And it's expressed an objection to why he said, why AI is going to be impossible? Why will it be impossible? He said, there are many things that we know how to do, but we cannot explain how we do that. Think of uh, I, uh, some years ago, I tried to teach an adult 
to ride bicycle. And I said, it's very easy. All you have to do, sit on the seat and pedal. Look, I do that. It's very easy. Go ahead, do it. And I realized that I could not explain how I balanced myself on the bike. You just do it. And so the thought Polanyi was saying, how are we ever going to write a program to do things that we cannot explain how to do? And now these techniques of deep learning give us an answer. You don't have to have rules. All you have to do is keep trying and learning what are the things that will work out using these deep learning techniques. And in fact, people have been trying to automate driving now for roughly for the past 10 years. Uh, in the, in the, about a decade ago, DARPA launched a so-called the Grand Challenge, which is autonomous driving in the in desert in uh, Death Valley. And in 2004, no car was able to do it more than uh, about seven miles before it would just go into a ditch, it would collapse, it would turn over, something would happen. But they all learned from it. And by 2005, a Stanford car went 139 miles in unrehearsed desert trail. And it was such a success that two years later, DARPA did it again, now in an urban area. And again, a CMU car this time was able to go 55 miles with no accident, no traffic violation. And so it became clear already then that, that automating driving is something that's about to happen. And now everybody knows about the, the Google car, right? This is a, the nice thing about the interesting about the car. This is a car without a driving wheel, right? An automated car does not need a driving wheel. In fact, the people here can only sit in the back. And so in the Bay Area, you can go and you see these Google cars kind of driving around. Now, to put it in context, I'm going to go back and give kind of what we call macro history, big things. This is, we have several transportation revolutions in human history. The first one is about 7,000 years ago. One of the biggest human inventions invented the wheel. Think what, what, what would life look like without a wheel? We would not be able to build the pyramids if we didn't have the wheels to transport these big boulders, these big pieces of, uh, of rock and stone. And then it took us almost a couple of thousand years, so 1,500 years, and then we domesticated the horse, probably somewhere in, uh, in the steppes of, uh, of Asia. And uh, for a long, long time, trans you know, non if you didn't walk on your legs, you rode on a horse. And the Mongol Empire went all the way from the Pacific Pacific Ocean all the way practically to Europe, and they just did it on a horseback. And that, that invention stood, think about it, from roughly from 3500 BC, there was no significant change in transportation until about, 100, 100, uh, until about uh, what is it, about 200 years ago, when steam power gave us a steam locomotive. And that was a huge, huge, huge change. I mean, if you look specifically, in this country, you cannot imagine the United States as a continental country without being able to go between the East Coast and the West Coast by train. Therefore, the, continental, the, the transcontinental continental railway was such an important thing in tying together the country into one country. And then about 100 years after that, we had the Ford Model T. Now, it's not the first automobile, but it's the first automobile that becomes a mass product sold to people in the middle class. And the Ford Model T gave us this, <laughs> and this, and this. In my opinion, the, the automobile is the most significant industrial product of the 20th century. So of course, we have lots of computer scientists, electric engineers, and they will say, no, 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 it was a transistor, the integrated circuits. Forget about it, it's the automobile. The automobiles, first of all, shape the way the country looks. The way the country looks was shaped by the automobile. It gave rise to a mighty American industry. Today, we think of the car industry as it has been, and we forget how 50 years ago, this was American industry. And I would say even more, if you, if you know how to make cars, you can make trucks and tanks, and you can win World War II. You cannot imagine win, winning World War II if we don't have the industrial infrastructure that started by making cars. And there was a whole cult, cult, car culture. I mean, cars symbolize adulthood and, and freedom. And even when people imagine science fiction, they could imagine science fiction without the car. This is, this is the car El Cho from Mad Max. The, even dystopian future had the, the, car, the car in it in one way or another. But the, the automobile did not come without cost. 
So if you want to think, for example, we talk today a lot today about climate change and global warming. Well, it started here in Texas, not too far from here, but a couple of hours from here in Spindletop, Texas, 1901, the Lucas Gusher. Lucas was the engineer, and you can see the Lucas Gusher. And so a few years later, Ford has to decide what is the source of energy for the Model T. It should be steam, electricity, coal, and answer at that point become clear. It should be gasoline. And now, by now, gasoline mostly is consumed by, by automobiles. But perhaps even more significant is every year, about one and a quarter million people die from car crashes. In fact, this is, we just learn to accept it as this is the cost, cost of doing business, so to speak. This is what life is. Life is people die from car accidents. But it's a huge cost. And in fact, one of the reasons today we call it, we don't call them car crashes, we call them car accidents. This was really a marketing term by the car industry to get us more accepting of the concept that people die in, in, in droves by cars every year. And this, they mostly affect people in the middle tier of life. In fact, you, if you're between 15 and 29, your biggest risk is car crashes. I travel to Israel quite often, and people ask me, aren't you worried when going to Israel? I said, of course I'm worried. They, travel like ma they drive like maniacs. <laughs> the property damage is, is estimated more than half a trillion dollars a year. This is a huge, huge, huge societal cost. And now we might have a technology to address maybe not all accidents, but at least the big bulk of car accidents. In fact, Ralph Nader became famous where in 1965 he published this book, Unsafe at Any Speed. And he essentially blamed the American car industry for producing for unsafe cars. But the main reason that so many people car die in car accidents, I have to tell you, is not the cars, it's you and me, all of us. Because we are really terrible drivers. This is the, the bad news. More than 90%, the less estimate I saw was 94% of car crashes are caused by human error. Driving too fast, under the influence, failure to keep in lane, failure to read way, distracted, careless driving, and so on and so forth. And so if we can get the human out of the equation, we can hope to save maybe 90% of these accidents. So now we're talking about saving million lives per year. So there is now a bit of a gold rush in this technical area. There is kind of a gold rush atmosphere. You have many, many companies rushing in, trying to get into this technology. Uh, this goes from, as you heard, technology company, the Google car, maybe Apple, we don't know, Baidu, whole bunch of startups. The car companies themselves, they have to stay in business. They know that this is a fight for their survival. And then the, the new transportation companies, the Uber and the Lyft, all of them are trying to get into this. The market is estimated somewhere between two to five trillion dollars over the next decade. This has been in the news, you know, Tesla has this semi-autonomous car and there have been some accidents. So there are debates whether this is something going to happen in five years or in 15 years. I think 10 years is a, is, a inter, is a fairly reasonable bet for solving the technical issues. There are many legal issues. In many states, you have to have always a moving car has to have a driver by law. Uh, there, are, there are issues if the car, if you see a person, uh, the car is driving and there is a passenger in the car and there is someone on the road whose life takes precedent. And should we, should we let philosophers decide? Should, should the Congress decide? What should we do about it? It is clear that this will have major, major, major business, business uh, uh, disruption because the automobile is an incredibly inefficient product. 90% of the cars just sit there and do absolutely nothing. Not to mention that about 25% of the urban area is just for car parking. And so we can see many industries being disrupted. The, the car manufacturing industry, insurance industry, the legal industry, the medical industry, huge, this is gonna be a huge, huge change in our lives. But it may save million lives per year. To me, that means that there is a moral imperative to pursue and deploy this technology, not to mention it would liberate many people who are now, who are now constricted, uh, restricted in their, in their mobility by you know, elders, disabled. So it's a hugely beneficial technology. But, if you look in more than 50% of the states, a truck driver is the most common job in more than 50% of the states. If you look at 
it's, it's not a plurality. You look at the, at the job that has the most number of people, it's truck driver. Wow. So we are talking about about 4 million trucks and taxi drivers in the United States. Now, these are people who are classified as drivers. Now, take a look at people, look at your job description, and see what do they do in their job. Say, suppose you are a postal delivery worker. Mostly what you do is you are a driver. Now we're talking about 15 million kind of jobs like that. But if you automate cars, it's not only cars you're going to automate. What about the cargo ships? People are, people are already talk, working about automating cargo ships, and the ports, and the trucks, and the warehouses, and the delivery. Wow. Pretty soon we're talking about many, 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 many millions of jobs that will be, become obsolete by technology. Now here comes the standard wisdom, and it says, oh, yes, Technology destroys jobs, but it creates new jobs. Everything will work out. Here we are. Everything is fine. So is this, is this true? So this has become recently a matter of fierce debate between prominent economists. So here you have Ken Rogoff, called himself a new classical uh, economist. And he says, hogwash. People have been worried about technology killing jobs since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Yes, it always killed jobs. It always created new jobs. Everything worked out. Nothing to worry about. Notice that he does sneak in, albeit possibly after a long period of painful adjustment. How long? How painful? He didn't say. Okay. But he said, nevertheless, nothing to worry about in the big way of, in the big scheme. But then other prominent economist, Paul Krugman, says, can innovation and progress really hurt? large number of workers, maybe even workers in general. The truth is that it can, and serious economists have been aware of these possibilities for almost two centuries. So between the neoclassical and the new Luddites, what is the debate? The new Luddites are saying, this time it is different. The neoclassical are saying, no, this time it is not different. Who is right? The answer is, nobody knows. So this has now become a very popular subject, and almost every month there is a new study. McKinsey believes 45% of jobs will be replaced. Gartner says no, one in three. Oxford said 47. OECD says 9%. 9%. Who is right? Why do we have so many different, uh, uh, different predictions? So there is a famous quote due to either Albert Einstein or Niels Bohr or Mark Twain or Yogi Berra, one of these guys. <laughs> and it says, Predictions are difficult, especially about the future. But I like to paraphrase it. Predictions are easy, especially about the future. I can make predictions. You can make predictions. Everybody can make predictions. Correct predictions are hard, especially about the far future. So the answer is, we really don't know. The future is, is inherently unknown. So who is right among all these uh, studies? Who is right here? I don't know. I can have my opinion. But your opinion, my opinion is good as yours. So what I said, instead of looking at the future, why don't we look at the past? Let's look at the past. How can we look at the past? Let's look at some other industry. Let's see how that industry has fared over, over the past generation. And that industry that I'm going to take is manufacturing. Why? Manufacturing is a huge industry. It's the biggest sector of the economy, about twice as big as the next one, which is government. Somehow we think that all of, all of our industry, all our economies become service-based. Yes, we'll see where it becomes service-based, but it's still, it's a huge industry. In fact, American industry, manufacturing, is so big that it's roughly the size of Germany and Korea and France and Russia and Brazil and the UK combined. Okay? China is, is by now has surpassed the United States. But other than that, it's a huge industry. So the conventional wisdom is that we have lost all of our manufacturing to China or NAFTA or something like that. Well, let's look at the numbers. So what you see here, the red line, is manufacturing by volume in real dollars, in constant dollars. And you can see that we are a manufacturing giants. And up to the zig normal zigzag that you see with economic numbers, we are now at peak manufacturing. But what happened? The blue line gives you employment. What happened to employment? You can see that roughly we peaked in uh, around 1980. And since then, essentially, we are going down. And we have lost 
about eight, eight million jobs out of about 20 million jobs over the past generation. Why did we lose the job? Here is another one that will give you a, an idea. So again, the blue line is manufacturing share of the GDP. And you can see it's about flat. It's about 12%. It's not really changed. But if you look at the manufacturing employment share, it used to be about 25%, and it is now below 10%. So manufacturing used to be a huge employer, and it's becoming a smaller and smaller employer. And what is driving this? The obvious things, productivity. We have be simply become much, much more productive in manufacturing. Just over the last 20 years, manufacturing productivity has doubled. So it's not surprising that we need fewer people to do that. In fact, here is a nice photograph of the Tesla Model S factory floor. Beautiful, shiny factory floor. There is something you don't see here. Not a single person. Why? They're not needed. In fact, this is an old, an old uh, joke in GM. And the joke was at some point they will only need a man, a man and a dog. The dog to make sure that the man does not touch the machines. And the man to feed the dog. <laughs> so now we can ask, OK, all these people lost jobs. So how did they do? So again, class, new classical economy, economics will tell us, well, they found other jobs. Let's see how well they did. Let's see how they failed. And what I'm going to show you now in almost tedious details is how, how harshly, what the harsh impact that automation has had on middle and working class American for the past 40 years. Now, I bet that this is going to be news for most of you. And I have to tell you, this was mostly news for me. And why is that? Because I have to tell you, all of us live in a bubble. What is the bubble? The bubble is of educated professional class. Not necessarily, you don't know, I don't know that many people necessarily think of them as the 1%. But there is the, the professional educated class that has very little interaction with working class people. And therefore, we had no idea what was going on. And in fact, much of it has come to light only recently because of the election, because people start thinking, what's going on? What's this, where is this anger coming from? So you'll see where this anger is coming from. So. There are really four very important macroeconomic numbers that one has to look at. One is productivity. It is absolutely understood that productivity growth drives economic growth. And so here is what you see, four numbers, productivity and GDP and employment, which means jobs, and income, which means wages. And what you see is from 1953 until roughly 1983, these four numbers move together. Productivity improved. The economy grew. We generated a job. Income has risen. And people's, the assumption was that that's all you need. If, if the economy, if productivity grows, everybody will benefit. Except that that's stopped happening about 30 years ago. So this has become known as a great decoupling. And what's happening here? We see that productivity still grows, and GDP grows. But we are not generating as many jobs as we used to generate, and income is not growing either. Somehow, this, the, the, the fact that the economy grows overall, does, the benefits are not distributed evenly across the economy. So what are the implications of that? When I saw this, I have to say, I gasped. And I'll gasp again. I, this is not my first, it's not my first last gasp. This looks at real, real means adjusted for inflation. Real hourly earning of production workers. And what you can see here, that in 2015, adjusted for inflation, production workers are at the same place where they have been in 1968. 1968, that was a long time ago, OK? Almost 50 years ago, we see production workers making no progress for 50 years. Wow. And since Piketty wrote his book, Thomas Piketty published his book about two years ago about, about capital in the 21st century and put a focus on inequality, we are much more sensitized. And we can see, again, over the past generation, when you look at the growth in income, then you see that, that uh, the bottom 90% has gone down. And all the benefits went to the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%, and mostly to the point or 1%, the 1% of the 1%. They, have, they had the, the biggest change in their income. 
Now, some people looked at, uh, at inequality and they says, well, this is class war. We are just jealous of people who are working hard and doing well. The point is that we understand now that going inequality is bad for everybody. So one of the things we like to believe that, that people have is not, if they don't have equality, they have at least equality of opportunity. That somehow with, with, with dedication, hard work, you can move up the socioeconomic ladder. But we know now that inequality and mobility are negatively correlated. The more inequality you have, the less mobility you have. So if you look at the left side of the curve, you have, you have low inequality and high mobility. You find the Scandinavian countries. And at the upper right-hand corner, you find high inequality and low mobility. Is US, Spain, Italy, even France. So the more inequality we have, the American dream, which is related to social mobility, diminishes. But even more than that, economic growth is reduced when you have higher inequality. Because economic growth requires robust consumption. And the 1% is just not big enough I mean, how many yachts and, and cars and fancy cars and houses you can buy? We need robust middle class to drive the economy. And so we see, again, negative correlation between inequality and economic growth. And that affects everyone. So one of the things, this is a recent Gallup poll. And this is what they call social class self-identification. You, you just ask people, how do you define yourself? Are you upper class, upper middle and middle class, or working class? And what we see is that the upper class, by self-identification, this has nothing to do with the actual your real wealth. Upper class is decreasing, and the middle class is decreasing, and the working class and the lower class is rising up. It turns out if you actually look at real income, this trend gets even sharper. This is just self-identification. It gets worse if you actually measure people's real income. And even poverty. So if you look at poverty over five years of being poor, that has been kind of uh, going on stable. So at age 60, you have a probability of about 12% to spend at least one year in poverty, uh, five years in poverty. But one year in poverty, you have a probability of almost 40%. By age 60, 40% of the people will have at least one year that they will be officially poor. And the extent of it has become clearer in, in just in the past year, just two surveys. Uh, you ask people if you have a sudden expense, unexpected expense of $400, can you cope with it? 40%, 47% of the people says, nope, I don't, have, I don't have the reserves. I don't know, I'll have to go to my family. I don't know what I'll do if I have $400. You raise it to $1,000 unexpected expense. Two thirds of the people cannot cope with it. Now think about it, $1,000, it means that your transmission of your car breaks down. And you need your car to get to a job. And if you lose your car, you lose your job. And you don't have any means of coming up with $1,000 to fix your trans to replace your transmission. Now here is another place where I gasp. I, there will be, this is my second gap, there will be one more. This is what's called labor force participation. So what is labor force participation? So you hear a lot about, about, about unemployment and how it gone down. It's below 5%. This is great news, lots of new jobs. So the unemployment that is reported usually is what's called U3. It's one measure of unemployment, actually many measures of unemployment. It only measures the percentage of people who are looking for a job and cannot find a job. What happened to people who stopped looking for a job because they just gave up? So a broader measure is called labor force participation, which is what percentage of the work of the, of the populations are working? Now, this focus on men, 25 to 54. So this is after normal education, before you start retiring. These are the people who are supposed to be the backbone of the country. In fact, if you go back to 1960, 97% of them used to work. This is what men used to do. And now you see, over the past 50 years, it's been going down, 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 and down. Now, if I showed you population as a whole, it will be more mixed. Why? Because in 1960, women entered the workforce, and they went up. Women are also going down, going down now. But for men, it's just it's just very, very clear trend. And that's why you focus on what's called prime age, so you can take education out, and you can take retirement out. 
And this is now a huge topic. What happened? What's happening here? Why are these men not working? In fact, uh, Larry Summers recently said, let's do a linear regression and project it. And he says, if we right now one in eight men is out of the workforce, if this trend continue in about uh, 35 years, we'll have one in four men will not be working. Now, this is even more brutal if you look further by education. If you take at people, for example, without college education, this becomes even steeper. And even other measures, the labor share of the, of the GDP, of the national income, that was used to be around 50%, and people thought it's an economic law that should be at about 50%. And it's not. It's been going down. More and more of the economy is capital and profits rather than wages. So what's going on? Okay, so this is a whole bunch of, of data just to show you, and part of it explain to you why there's a lot of frustration in the country with the economy. But in a nutshell, what's happening is what they call job polarization. So you look at the jobs, and you can put them what's called the skill spectrum. And roughly, it has to do by how much we pay people to do this job, from very low end to very high end. And, and this shows, a, this shows the, the change in employment, the creation of job, according to the skill level. And what you see here, that on the, very ra on the right hand side, at the high end, we're generating jobs. And at the very low end, which is very low skill, we're also generating jobs. So where, where are we losing jobs? In the middle of the skill spectrum. Why is that? Because job at the very high end, there are, there are, there are, we may want to automate them because we're, pay, we're paying these people high salaries, but they're very difficult to automate. We thought of sending a robots to give my talk, and we decided it's still too challenging to do that. <laughs> at the very low end, it's actually difficult to automate. Think of. Imagine you want to build a robot that would bust tables in a restaurant. How much dexterity and agility and situational awareness you need just to clean tables in a restaurant? And we pay these people minimum wage. So it's, not, it's not, just not cost effective to do it. At the middle level, the skills are such that we can automate this job, and these people are getting paid enough that it economically makes sense to automate these jobs. So if we look at which jobs are growing, so you can divide all jobs on two dimensions. One is cognitive versus manual. I suspect that most of the people in this room do cognitive jobs other than manual jobs. And routine versus not routine. Even, even some, even, even there are cognitive jobs that are routine, and there are manual jobs that are not routine. And what you see is the growth of the jobs, either manual or cognitive, is the non-routine jobs, because these are jobs that are difficult to automate. And if you look at routine jobs, manual or cognitive, you don't, we don't see a growth in the, in the number of jobs. These are the jobs that are easier to automate. In fact, we can look at jobs lost and gain, the, the lost part of the recession, the early part of the recession, and then this after the recovery. And what we see is that we have lost many jobs at the high and mid wages spectrum. But you see the recovery for high wage jobs and mid wage jobs has been much, much less than the recovery at the low end. Because these are jobs that, again, we're not paying that much. Hey, why not create these jobs? And education is a huge distinguisher here. If you look at the, at the real hourly wages for people with advanced degrees, that means post baccalaureate degrees, they are seeing their wages grow. People with college education see their wages grow. People with some college or high school, they barely keep up. And people with less than high school, which is about 20% of the people in this country do not finish high school, they actually have lost in their, in their real hourly wages. This is my third gasp. I promised you three gasps. This is data that came out just uh, uh, last year by uh, two economists. Uh, the, um, Denton Dennis, um, Denton is the Nobel, just received the Nobel Prize Economics last year. And so they look at the mortality between ages 45 and 54 across different demographic groups over a period of roughly 20 years. And what you expect to see is that anywhere in the world, healthcare generally gets better. And therefore, mortality drops. These are people, think about it, 40, 45 to 54 is a kind of mid, mid, mid age to, to end plus. But unless you have disease, you expect 
healthcare to get better and better. And this is true in any countries, in different demographic groups. There's one exception, and this is US white. And if you zoom in, you see that this is US, US white without college education. And when you ask what are they dying from, they're dying from suicide. And now everybody understands there is opioid epidemic in this country. And where it's happening? Among working class white people. And the Washington Post did voting district by voting district and found an eerie correlation. It's a correlation. It's not causation. But the Donald Trump performed the best where you see more middle-aged white people dying. Obviously, it's not the people who are dying who are voting for Trump. But, <laughs> but the, the, the reason that people die, which is, again, a drug abuse and suicide, indicates a deep level of misery that seem to be correlated at least with voting for Donald Trump. And in fact, when I look at this data, I'm reminded of a, of a, a quote that some people may recognize. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. And man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. Anybody? Marx and Engels, the manifesto of the Communist Party. So we are seeing things that seem to be very similar to what was going on in the middle of the 19th century when, when the Industrial Revolution was kicking into very high gear. Now, there is a big difference between data and correlation and causation. What is causing this? There are many different theories. Many things happened in the economy. We changed tax law. We had financialization. We have globalization. Is automation a major factor here? Really, it's clearly not the sole factor. So the answer is this is still very much a subject of debate. But a recent poll among about 2,000 economists found that only 28% disagreed that automation is a major factor. And uh, 43 were agree, and 30% were uncertain. This was done uh, two years ago. I suspect that if it's done today, we will see more people think that automation play a major role, at least a major role, in this, uh, in this picture. So why, you know, what about this argument from the neoclassical? Technology creates jobs, destroys jobs, creates new jobs. It's always happening. Disruptive, disruptive innovation, they call it. Because we have never faced machines that may be able to add computers in everything or in huge part of what we are doing. In fact, you ask people who do AI, what's their goal? That's their goal. Their goal is to do everything that humans can do. It's just a question of how long will it take us? But that's the goal of AI research. So it's very dangerous, it seems, to think, well, just because there was a trend of the last 200 years, it must continue. Because there is a concept of a tipping point. What is a tipping point? Put some water on the stove. Turn the, the stove on. And you, you can stir at it for five minutes. And you conclude, if you hit water, it just gets warmer. Nothing else happens. But of course, we know that at some point, the water will boil. Physicists call it phase transition. Malcolm Gladwell uh, popularized it in his book, The Tipping Point, about when suddenly there is a, a, quality, a quantitative change due to a qualitative change. In fact, the best example of the tipping point is the Industrial Revolution. Imagine a bunch of economists discussing in the year 1700 what they expect to see happen in the next 1,000 years. And they will say, look, based on the last 1,000 years, nothing much. <laughs> Except that we know there was a tipping point. What happened? Well, it's complicated. Reformation, enlightenment, industrial revolution. Suddenly, things changed. Uh, Vasily Leontiev put a very nice parable that I, I like very much. He said, let's imagine two horses roughly in 1910, having a conversation. And one horse says, you know, I'm worried about my job. I heard about this Ford Model T is becoming very popular. And uh, the other horse, the new classical horse, says, not to worry. Throughout, throughout generation, there's always technology elim eliminated some jobs for horses, but also created new jobs for horses. So we should not worry about unemployment for horses. There will always be jobs for horses, says the new classical horse. 
Who was right? Well, the new loaded uh, horse was actually right. Because we know now that horse population peaked in 1915. And today, we still have charm job for horses, but most, most horses exist really as pets in one way or another, right? It's, it exists for our entertainment rather than to do a real, a real job. So this is all about relative speed. Will technology destroy jobs? Absolutely. It does it all the time. Does it create new jobs? Absolutely, it does. But will it do it in enough quantity and fast enough to avoid major societal disruption? That's not so clear. So uh, economists from uh, Oxford, Bergen and Frey, they went in 2010 and they wanted to know how many, they look at all the jobs, they look at the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the question was, how many new jobs are there? How many new jobs there are today that did not exist in 2000? Remember, this is the 2000, 2010, internet revolution, the web, mobile. They found that it was a tiny fraction. Half percent of the population held jobs that did not exist in 2000. Now, why is that? Well, look at that. Go back to Detroit, 1990. Not that far, not far time, long time ago, 1990. Look at the three big car manufacturers. Their market value was $65 billion in real dollars and they employed 1.2 million people. Today, go to Silicon Valley, take the big three, okay? This is Google and Apple and Facebook. They have a combined market value of one and a half trillion dollars and they employ 190,000 people. We just don't, don't need that many people to create real economic value. Jason Fuhrman, who is the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors of, of the president, wrote in a recent article something that I think is very profound. He said, my worry is not that this time could be different when it comes to AI, but that this time could be the same as what we have over the past generation. Now we are going through election, probably the most uh, divisive election that I remember at least in my lifetime. And one thing you do not hear any of the candidates talk about is about automation and its economic impact. President Obama, who's beyond electing now, he can think about the future, and he actually recently gave an interview, and he said one, two, two important things he said, in my opinion. One, it's about automation, it's just not just about uh, globalization. Globalization really served as an economic drive to drive automation. Companies had to automate to survive the global marketplace. And the second thing he said, look, we went through some ranging changes before. 19th century, we went through a huge change. And then we had the Great Depression. And we completely changed how we manage our socioeconomic life. If you think today, anything you think today about, about labor laws, it's all fairly recent. You know, as, as far as, uh, you know, if you just, I never watch, but I, hear, I read about Downtown Abbey, and there you have people are called indentured servants. These people sign a contract. They're going to be servant for 25 years. And if they try to break the contract, they'll be thrown into jail. This was considered. They said, you went into this contract willingly. That's it. You cannot break it. And we had to change the law to make our, our economy more humane. And so Obama is saying we'll have to do something similar now as, the, as our circumstances change dramatically again. And I hope I convince you that this is topic is a very important topic, and that's why we're organizing in about a month and a half a conference here at Rice University it's called Human, Machines, and the Future of Work. Uh, there are brochures around, and uh, I will not be talking there. I'm done talking. <laughs> and we're trying to bring a broad spectrum of distinguished speakers, technologists, economists, so social scientists, humanists, to look at this picture of the future of work from a very broad perspective. Thank you very much. We'll have room for a few questions, so give signal. There's a microphone on this side, microphone here, so let me know. Mercy, thank you. That was wonderful and, and enormously convincing. So my question is, okay, what's going to, what human beings need to matter? They need to have something to do that, 
that gets them up in the morning, makes them feel like they're making a contribution. What, what do you see as the future of work uh, or the future of human life, uh, nine billion of us in a world that is so fully automated? While he's answering, put your hand up so we can get you a microphone while you wait. So what I try to do in this talk is really to convince people, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and I shy away from time for them to discuss solutions. Because as soon as you go into solutions, the devil is in the details. It's hard to find solutions everybody agrees on. I mean, you know, it's, it just, it's first good, I think, to focus on just discussing is there a problem. When you, when you, if you accept it, the automation will be a major disruption, at least to the labor market, then you need to think about two sides of the picture. One is the economic side, okay? We live in a world where we, most of us, the vast majority of us, we have to work for a living. Okay, you want to live, you have to work. And that's how we structure our life. And if you fall out of it, I mean, you have mis miserable existence. Now, people are not working, but they have miserable existence. And how do we address that aspect? And this is, I think, what Obama is referring to is the social compact. And uh, there are different discussions. In fact, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, no, the day before yesterday, on Tuesday, I find myself as a speaker in a conference called Stuffing World. Okay? Stuffing World. What is Stuffing World? Stuffing World is the meeting of the American Stuffing Association. So what is Staffing Association? These are all the HR people in a big, in a big, big sense, and they're starting to worry now, oh, what's going to happen to work? What happened to us? And so one, we had another speaker to talk about various policy alternatives. And the one that is most discussed is something called a UBI, Universal Basic Income, which is a very old proposal that goes back, in fact, to people like uh, Milton Friedman, and recently Charles Merai, again, tried to revive it. The, the idea is to replace all kind of uh, uh, federal benefits, federal instead benefits, by one program, everybody gets a monthly check, which is enough for basic, basic existence, okay? And so you, the reason this pro probably originated on the, on the right was they, they hate the, the nanny state, and so they want to kill all these programs where bureaucrats decide who gets it and who doesn't get it. Let's just give it to everyone, okay? And so this is an idea that has supporters on the left and on the right, and it has people who object to it on the left and on the right. So, but it's become a matter of discussion. I think we will hear more and more about it. And then, to me, there is, in some sense, the more fundamental question. Let's assume that we solve the, the socioeconomic question, okay? You know, the reality is that for the past, uh, you know, I don't know, million years, we had to work for a living. In fact, I look at, I read the biblical story of the, the, that we're thrown out of paradise. And to me, it's a parable, people asking, how come we're the only one around here working? All the other animals seems to have it just, you go, you graze. We have to work for a living. Why is that? Especially if you're a farmer, you say, why do we have to work for a living? And the answer was, well, it's a careless because of the original sin. But, so that careless defined us for depending how you want to count, at least if you are a literalist, maybe 6,000 years or whatever. But even if you look at the biblical stories, Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of knowledge. In the long run, they outsmarted God. So the curse was, right, in sorrow you shall give birth, in the sweat of thy brow you shall eat. So by now we have a pedural, so, you know, giving birth is not as painful. And finally we even figure out how we are not going to have to walk. And the question is, I think it's a profound philosophical question and sociological questions. What do people do when they don't have to work? And I think this is, this, I don't have an answer to that. I think this is a, a huge question. It goes back to, you know, to Socrates. What is the meaning of good life? Very deep questions. Moshe, <clears throat> there are two questions I have. What is the effect of population? And the, what, what is? Population. population. Different countries have different rates of uh, population growth. For example, you know, I'm originally from India. Indian population has grown by leaps and bounds. And if you look at the wealth, those countries are, you know, growing in GDP and so on. At the same time, if you look to the West, the younger, the bulge that we talk of, you know, 35 years or so in India and other places are growing, whereas in the West it's actually going up, more and more aged people are there. What do you think the effect of this has on all this, actually? 
So Rodney, Rodney Brooks is a well-known roboticist at MIT. And he says, we need all these robots to take care of the elder, elderly people. So the answer is, there's clearly going to be a huge change in demographics over the next uh, couple of generations. And the answer is, I don't think anybody really fully understand what's going to be the impact. I mean, one of the things people are looking, for example, in Japan, that now for, for about 20 years had very, 25 years, I think, had very lackluster growth, almost no growth. And why is that? And some people say it's because of aging. And in fact, there is a big debate. If you look now at our own economy, then with the last, the growth that we've had for the past, uh, again, 15 years has been, uh, you know, after a century, we had the boom of the late 90s. Since then, it's been it's begin very, very mild. Productivity is not growing as fast as it used to grow. And again, people are debating, uh, a well-known economist, Gordon, recently wrote a book, The End of Growth, saying this is it. We had a few generations, we have a one generation of, you know, not one generation, but essentially from the 1800 to roughly 1950 of fast growth, it's over, get used to it. This uh, no growth is the new normal. So again, people asking, does it have to do with, with, uh, with demographic? The answer is my opinion, no one knows. Any other? This is kind of a monkey wrench, but um, when you've shown us all the metrics and they've been over thousands of years, we've been very stable in our climate. I mean, what about climate change on the nature of work with these disruptions we're seeing in parts so, of our economies? So this is this is the this is the care, this is a plot of the economy, economic growth. But if you look, I think at let's say carbon particle in the in the atmosphere, it's probably going to be an exact match for that. Okay, the only thing it may not we may not see uh, so much distinction between countries. I'm not sure about that. But it's very clear that it's it's very very strongly correlated with the industrial revolution. Okay. Um, there are, there are predictions, in fact, the automated cars will, can, can have a major impact on, I don't know about climate, but at least on, uh, on carbon pollution, because they can be electric, you know, we can uh, manage them with a fleet, we can manage it much, much better. So some people predict that we will see a major reduction in emissions of carbon particles. Do you think that we can maintain a uh, democratic society uh, with this change in, in, in what's going on? Can we maintain? You have to be an educated citizen in order to, to properly decide how you're going to vote. If, there, if you're no prospects of, of getting a, a job, uh, unless you're very smart. So. Um, Many people think that obviously we see the jobs are at the high end of the skill ladder and therefore the solution would be better education, more education. I have to say, I think this is a matter of, I think this is, this is quite controversial. So we have, we have pushed hard on improving education in this country. We now have 80% of the people finish high school. Can we do better? Yes. I don't think we'll get to 100%. I mean, one of you do that by, by diluting the meaning of, of education. We have about a third of the people go to finish college. Can we make this much higher? So let me just give you an example. Suppose that we decide that to really get a good job in the economy of the future, you need a PhD. Is the solution OK? So everybody's going to get a PhD? I think we realize that this is, this is it's a, it's a bit ridiculous. So even though I think we can always improve education, we have to think very carefully how to do that. One thing that I did not get into is I, I only showed you here essentially US data. When you start to look at other countries, you see that public policy matters a lot, which is different countries react in a different way. For example, Germany is, still has a successful industry and did not see this kind of reduction in, the, in, in, the, in manufacturing. Why? One reason that manufacturing workforce is higher skilled than in the United States. So they have all this apprentice system and they train people and they said their people are doing non-routine stuff. And so they get, for example, lines that you can, you can refurbish the line or can you rechange the line much more quickly than if you have robots, if you have people, if they have high enough skills. In fact, I will go next week to give a talk to a bunch of BMW executives. We will see what happens. Moshe, 
It, it seems to me that uh, science and engineering technology have been immensely uh, successful, and the automation is an example of that. And what that now does is give us the opportunity, the luxury, of, of contemplating the stuff that comes out of the humanities. So that, in fact, literature and art and theater and music uh, will be the, the future rather than STEM courses and uh, technology. So that we'll end up with, a, with not just more or less, but it'll be a different nature of activities for the society. So people have tried to look at this question, what will people do by looking at people now who are not working? And you can look at two groups. One is people who are retired and to see what are they doing. And look at some of these young men who are not working and you see what are they doing. So by now we have some sobering answers. So retired people, what are they doing? Watching TV. <laughs> I mean, it's simplistic and not doesn't encompass everyone. But people are talking about you know, like five hours a day or, or, and six hours a day is of t TV watching. What do these young men do? Video games. Yeah. And so this, somehow this idea that we will all start writing poetry and <laughs> join uh, Shakespearean troops, somehow I don't quite know that it fits, it fits reality. Uh, one of the slides you showed, uh, it was notable that the four least unequal societies were all the Scandinavian countries, all four of them, all the way over on the left. <clears throat> and uh, they are countries that have what you might call plan, more planned societies compared with uh, ours and maybe the Northwestern European or the Western European countries. So could you give some impression of what you think? And, and I guess what I'm groping for is the possibility that in countries where there is more attention given to quality of life through public planning, which I think is a fair description of those countries, uh, does this have an impact on... So it's actually interesting to see that the, the two countries that have been kind of most affected by automation in, in the of the past generation has been both the United States and the United Kingdom, which have adopted roughly at the same time much more less fair economics. Okay? Um, you know, other countries have less of a problem with being more pragmatic and making trying to say, okay, what works? What policy works? And if it works, then it's a good policy. If it doesn't work, then it's a bad policy, and measure it more by consequences than by ideology. Okay? And we have become very ideological in this country. So instead of, so, you know, you can look at healthcare as an example where instead of trying to figure out something that works, it's become incredibly ideological and impossible to experiment and try things and see what works and what doesn't work. Okay? So now we have to be very careful because you cannot necessarily, a policy that works in one country may not necessarily transfer to another country. I mean, we have a much more diverse population than, than Denmark, for example. And even these countries, partly because of immigration, they are becoming more diverse. And certain set of shared values that used to be there may not exist anymore. They'll have to figure out how to deal with it. But uh, this, is, this is rather striking. This, this distinction is rather striking. Yeah. We have a question over here. Uh, one more after that. Get your hand up. And if not, we'll close out. Yeah, so during the Great Depression, a lot of jobs were lost, and the government had to step in with uh, programs like the public jobs programs like Work Progress, Works Progress Administration, Civilian Conservation Corps, and so on. Um, given the number of technolo technological changes that might be happening sort of over the next few decades, I was just wondering if you've heard in recent months, are policymakers looking, let's say, to maybe modernize these programs uh, just in case there happens to be a major dislocation in, in jobs in the future? Well, we have, in fact, there was one thing that amazingly Trump and, and Clinton agreed on is the decline of infrastructure in the United States and the need to make major investment in infrastructure. And, um, of course, one will have to, uh, to debate how we're going to pay for it, etc. But if we do that, then one of the things, in fact, economists tell us infrastructure has huge economic benefits. I mean, there is, it contributes in a massive way to economic growth. And generally, if you look at uh, who are the people are going to be working in, in this, it's going to be maybe some of these men who are out of, out of jobs. At the same time, we must remember that more and more infrastructure jobs today 
are automated, okay? I mean, you used to remember, I mean, you used to remember uh, reading about how they, they dug these tunnels in the Alps. People would go there with, with you know, hammers and, and hammer through the rock. And now there are these huge drillers. Now the, the, most recent, the most recent tunnel that was open was completed in record time with a much, much smaller, uh, require a much smaller labor food stamp than we needed before. So even uh, you have to, you know, if technology continues to proceed, even this kind of public works are going to be to some extent automated. Final question over here. Final question, okay. So uh, I think humans are quite good at uh, sort of defining meaning. You know, like for instance, you would imagine that uh, many, many years ago, a person had to run fast because they had to get somewhere, right? But then uh, if that was the only reason, then athletics would be completely meaningless now. When we still like have a attached meaning towards good athletes, right? Like good, good strength trainers and things like that, because we're like, okay, we're gonna define that this is a valuable thing to pursue and we're all gonna say, uh, put accolades on people who do well. So maybe this is the sort of future, right, where we say, okay, uh, if you can write something beautiful, then you're good. Like, you don't need money. We have, like, all, everybody has money. And, yeah. so. so people think about what they call the human economy, okay? So to say sometimes we go today, first of all, we lost to chess. We lost chess to machines. We continue to have chess uh, contests, right? We lost speed to cars, but we continue to have, uh, we still think that Usain Bolt is a very fast runner. We don't say, well, you know, the Model T is faster than Usain Bolt. And so, and in fact, we buy various handmade stuff, and it, it has some emotional value for us. So people talk about there will be some growth of a human economy in these things. You know, I, it's, it's possible. The answer is, you know, is not that, uh, you know, if you ask me, some people ask me, are you a pessimist or an optimist? And uh, I'm a, a, a second generation Holocaust survivor. And it means that on one hand, I must be supremely pessimist because of the, the, the sheer loss in my family. It's just, it's just astounding. But here I am. And so I must be also supremely optimist. So I'm a, I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.